Fox Show Final, JCM Jones from the Mothership and Dirty South Soccer. Joe Patrick from 92.9 The Game and Dirty South Soccer is over there. Tony Ward winner Nathan Lane could not be with us today, but Joe, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here too, Sam. We were going to record on Monday again, and then we once again postponed. We've you know, last week we we postponed to, you know, pay reverence to our past presidents, President's Day, of course. Nobody can work on President's Day. You must uh-huh. you know, have a moment of solitude. Name a president. George Hamilton. Yeah, good try. Good try. <laughs> um, no, Joe had a premonition. Joe had a premonition. Yeah. And he was like, I think, I think if we wait till after Monday, some news will go down. And then like eleven forty five, like thirty minutes before the Ibarra announcement, he was like, Oh hey. A bar is coming, and also I'm a genius. So, good on <laughs> too Joe. Quiet, too quiet, too quiet. Exactly, exactly. Um, it may be quiet for a little bit after this. It's going to be interesting to see what else is coming next. I think there may be one person we have in mind coming into this team, but right now we're we're getting very, very close to the end product with this yep. team. Uh, and there there were a few big moves. We're going to talk about those, of course, in just a little bit. But first, before we do that, we do have a little bit of housekeeping to get to. Yeah, we have a, a big announcement coming in a week a week from today. So everybody get ready. Mm. Uh, we've been working behind the scenes on something that I hope everybody's going to like. So um, there are no scenes. This is not a, <laughs> this is not a production. There's a, I mean, there is a YouTube thing, but like besides uh, that. Yeah, no, we've uh, we've been working on, you know, bringing a lot more to you guys. So we're very much looking forward to that. I'm just looking forward to the season in general getting started. But, um, you know, it's all this excitement. It's kind of pent up and uh, can't wait to kind of share what we're doing next week. And then also just want to give another shout out because we don't really plug it enough. But um, if you want to watch this conversation uh, on video, then you can watch it on YouTube where you can subscribe to Dirty South Soccer and get these conversations. We'll be doing more polished video stuff like we've done. If you're familiar with the channel um, with Rob Usry doing the video editing and that kind of thing. So some good stuff on there and we'll have a lot more once the season gets going. So just wanted to give a shout out to that. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we're excited about the big things coming. We're excited about the big things coming. We are. We are. We feel good about it. We think you all are going to feel good enough about it to make it worth doing, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So just keep an eye out for that. It's a big week for Atlanta United. It's going to be a big week for us as training kicks back. Uh, probably by the time you're listening to this, that folks will be in training technically if you are listening to this the day after we release it. Yeah, I think we'll have some players reporting tomorrow, I think. Tomorrow is uh, correct. Yeah, so that, that'll be interesting. Which is the 24th. will be uh, fun to hopefully see some pictures or whatever of guys coming to training uh, or going to the facility at least. So looking forward to all this stuff. Exactly, exactly. No media availability yet, so we won't quite have access to the guys yet. But as things kind of go along, we'll be able to get a little more insight and then hopefully just get back to the training ground and actually talk to these people in person again. That'd be lovely. That'd be real, real lovely. And then, of course, once we're able to do that, we'll get even more content coming your way as part of our special announcement coming up soon. We're very excited. We're very excited. We're also very excited, Joe. I get to see you Friday, I think. I think that's also has me excited that the kit drop is happening on the 26th. I think you're supposed to be there. I'm not sure. I will not be there. Oh, come um, on. Our intrepid reporter, Kyle Soto, will be representing okay, 30 cool. South Soccer. So you can hang out with Kyle, I guess, in your own cars separately, own car. waving right. to each other through the windows. <laughs> socially, dis- socially distance event, but um, uh-huh. it will be wild. I mean, I'm, I'm really intrigued to hear what your experience is going to be like uh, after it's over, because I went to the one before the 2019 season uh-huh. when they did it, when they invited people onto the field and they had this stage set up in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And it was like, Spring break, what's up? <laughs> it's like it's like light shows, DJ. People like uh, guys, shooting whiskey out of like t-shirt drunk cannons. Roger or something. Bennett. Yeah. Uh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was all really good. That's so. excellent. Was that the uh, was that the night that you got Waffle House with Roger it Bennett? It was. It yes. was. Okay. Yeah. The the story in DSS lore. You got to meet Roger Bennett. I got to meet LeVar Burton out of DSS stuff. Um, I think that's two of our biggest success stories so far. I- it's funny. So I had kind of been in contact with the club and Roger beforehand to catch up with him. And we were supposed to talk before he went on. And apparently he was like not in the right place and it took forever to track him down. By the time we tracked him down, it was just kind of funny. Like they finally found him. He was in 
one of the suites that's like on field level right behind the goals you know what i'm mm-hmm. talking about where there's like yeah. the people can like be out there and uh, it was just like so bizarre it's like oh he's in here and so you like walk in he's kind of it's like a darkly lit room and he's like going through <laughs> his like note cards um you know for the presentation or whatever that he was doing and he's drinking budweiser <laughs> amazing uh in there yeah classic roger bennett so good guy. beautiful beautiful I'm, I'm hoping for some like at least half that excitement on Friday. It should be interesting. It should be interesting to see the people's responses to it as it officially comes out. I'm assuming we're going to get see the third kit as well, uh, but we'll have more on that, that later as that those things exciting. come out. I think so. I think that, that's my gut call. I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. What I do know for sure, Joe Patrick, is that it's business time. Leaving a break for business time. Yeah. Business time, Joe Patrick. We're going to start off with the big announcement that came down Monday. Like you called, like you called, you, you called your shot. You pointed to center field and said, "Out there in center field sits Franco Abara." Franco Abara comes in to Atlanta United. Uh, he is a midfielder, and he is good from all from all perspectives so far. We have looked at some highlights. We have looked at some Seattle football stuff. We've looked at some stats. It seems to be a really, really positive signing. And uh, we'll talk more about it, but there's some interesting wrinkles, I think, kind of coming into this, especially with regards to how much of a salary cap hit he's going to have here. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that that's kind of the biggest news that came out of the announcement yesterday. Well, it wasn't something the club announced, but Felipe Cardenas put it on Twitter that he said he does not expect Franco Ibarra to be one of these U22 players, which Mm -hmm. is fascinating because to me, it would signify that he does not have much of a transfer fee, if any transfer fee, because that means if he's not a U22 player, then whatever transfer was paid for him will be priced into what his salary budget charge will be. So that would be huge if he's not. And I did see the initial report that Cesar uh, Luis Merlo um, put out there in late January, he said something about 80% 80% of the transfer, which is like kind of typical, we hear that all the time, like 80% of the pass or whatever of the pass. Yeah. Of, of the pass. And then, but he also for this one said, and, and a third plus a 30% capital gain. And so I wonder if that means that the player will take 30% of the future transfer. I'm not sure exactly what that means. It's not like hmm. terminology that we're used to. Um, so maybe it's one of those types of transfers where they don't spend the money up front and they sort of get more back later, whether that's the player or the club or whatever, yeah. which is, that would even be interesting to me because it seems like a lot of these Argentine clubs are kind of in some financial trouble with all this COVID, you know, kind of putting a stop to their gate revenues and stuff like that. So you would think that they would need the cash up front, uh, which apparently is what's happening with uh, another player we're going to talk about, but yeah, it's a great deal for Atlanta United and, uh, I want to also dig into this article that Toyota football put out today. We're recording this on Tuesday, uh, which has kind of rankled some feathers. I don't know if you have any comments. Yeah, no, he definitely has. He definitely has. He, he immediately kind of came out and said, so, so I, I don't think so. A bar, yeah. though. a bar though. And people are already mad at him. It's kind of awesome. I respect that. Of, of course, he's just going off the information he has. I'm not sure he even admits to not having, a ton of statistical stuff. He's also watched some video that we haven't seen. Things he like has that. A, he has access to a Y Scout account, which is like yes. this. Uh, it's a, a subscription service for clubs and journalists and whatever. Um, that basically it's just it's just film and stuff that's not on YouTube. So he's he has access to one of those. So he's seen a lot more of the footage um, than we've seen on on YouTube, which is obviously just going to highlight positives as where with Y scout you're seeing like every touch, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to say he's watched hours and hours of this footage, but I think he's seen a little bit more than we have. So it's interesting to see, you know, his take on these things. And me personally, I respect uh, Teoto football's just his opinion on (laughs) soccer. I think he knows what he's talking about. So um, it is just interesting because I think, you know, the transfer fee is apparently much bigger for Santiago Sosa. He obviously had that fee that fell that, that deal that, fell out with Everton a couple of years ago that was for an even mm-hmm. much much bigger fee so I think that for that reason I think that's why people were kind of expecting Sosa to be the more impactful player but it could be Ibarra I, I would say one thing that people with that article are kind of taking up upset- exception to is um, Teoto football's criticism of Sosa's passing it's basically saying that he's not <laughs> kind of the passer that mm-hmm. everybody's expecting I would say that that's not necessarily a terrible thing. Okay, maybe if he could be a more progressive 
passer, that would be better, but it's not always bad to have a guy who's playing as your anchor midfielder who can just at least recycle the ball around, you know, just kind of keep the ball moving, even if he's not doing anything super exciting with it. And Darlington Nagby never made super progressive passes. Of course, we know right. he could progress the ball with his feet, but I wouldn't I wouldn't take it as negative as, as some people have kind of taken it. Yeah, no, it's an interesting thing because I, th- I think we kind of, at least I did, I kind of penciled in Santiago Sosa is going to be the, that midfielder in uh, the back three that comes out in possession and finds a system that drops back in the middle of it and kind of dispenses the ball and everything like that. And he, he may still be, but one of the things I kind of picked up immediately from Ibarra's little highlight reel that they put out, and it's really the only thing we've really seen of him, is that he looked very, very comfortable in the middle of a back three distributing the ball, playing diagonal balls, playing long diagonal balls, things like that. Um, but the, the main thing here, I think, for everyone is we won't know until we know. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's one of those things where we only have so much sample size to go on, especially with Santiago, who's only really played, I think it's like 11 games uh, at, yeah. the, at the top level. So it, it, there's not a ton there. There's not a ton there. And what Teodal saw was bad. What Teodal saw was not great passing-wise. He seemed, <laughs> he immediately came to us and was like, guys, I'm upset. I got that. I understood that. But that doesn't mean that he's going to be completely terrible going forward. He's not going to be, he may not be completely terrible in MLS. He may not be completely terrible in this system. We won't know until we know. But I think you're right. I think that that high level transfer fee and everything like that is is based a lot on upsides. He'll talk about that a little bit in the piece. He has that upside. He has that kind of potential that teams are seeing. And that's kind of where that future value comes into the current value of the player in the transfer. And I think we've mentioned this before on a, on a previous show, but it's worth pointing out the fact that uh, by all accounts, according to reporters on the ground down there in Argentina, he didn't have the greatest year last year. It appears that he was kind of um, dejected after having that move to Everton fall apart. So, you know, that could have played into some poor form that he had last year and maybe he can snap out of that. So I wouldn't say, yeah, exactly what you said. It, we'll, we'll see. We'll see more about these guys and, I expect them all to kind of perform and look better in MLS <laughs> right. um, than in Argentina. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm excited about both these guys, uh, to be perfectly honest. As you should bring it back to Abara because he's kind of the news point here. Yeah. Um, what a what a tenacious, energetic bastard he's going to be. Got, he got them fast the twitch glorious, fibers. Though. Yeah, He's twitchy. Yeah. He's twitchy for sure. It looks like he's covering a lot of ground. It looks like he's in just about every single spot he can be. He is very eager to to get forward. When he can, which is exciting. I think one of the most exciting parts of looking at what Ibarra was doing was just seeing a team run at somebody. Do you remember the last time Atlanta United just ran at somebody and had multiple players in concert going forward, looking threatening? It's a completely foreign thing to me right now in my head, especially watching Liverpool the last few weeks and watching Atlanta United for the last year and everything like that. It's just been lacking in that. But to see that potential kind of come out would be excellent. As Joe yeah, points sure. to his spur it, scarf. Yeah, uh, talking about <laughs> I feel for you too. Team yeah. lacking in energy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and Carl's Bocanegra pointed that out too in the in the highlight video that the team put out there on social media, just kind of talking about all this stuff. And I think it it just makes a ton of sense. I think that that's one of the things I'm looking forward to most with this team next year is just to see how different midfield looks and feels. Just watching the team, just being so much younger and more energetic uh, as opposed to what we saw last year. So. I think mm-hmm. and, I, and I want to point out, too, I had some thoughts about, again, Sosa dropping back and back three, and then Ibarra kind of looks like the dude. And the real answer to that is why not both? Yeah, exactly. was those, right? Like they, there's their pivoty. appeal. Like these two it feels double pivoty. It's exactly right. You could see both of them kind of fluidly dropping back at any point and, and, and circulating the ball and everything like that that Heinze wants to do. I do think it's going to be more direct, and I, I'm excited about Ibarra's potential to potentially go with those long balls over the top and things like that that they could kind of extend that direct idea philosophy going on right now, especially too with his progressive carries. He seems, like I said, if he's in that back three, he's, he's willing to go ahead and step up and carry the ball forward. Kind of like we used to see LGP do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I would also say when you have two guys who can kind of do the thing, dropping into the back line or, or, you know, moving higher up the field, both of them have shown that ability that makes it even tougher for an, for an opposition. Right. You know, you can't just key on like Jeff Lorenowitz is going to be the guy who does this and then still <laughs> pressing triggers and things off of that. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that's seriously how it was, you know, no, you're especially exactly right. under, under Tata Martino. So um, I think it just gives uh, Gabriel Heinz a little added advantage there. 
Exactly, and it also, exactly. I, we should also say that this can be nothing but a positive for the players that are currently on the roster in those mm-hmm. spots that these guys are going to be fighting for because it just boosts the competition level um, of everybody. Everybody's fighting for spots. Everybody wants to further their careers and show themselves. And so in order to be able to do that, they're going to have to beat out the guys in front of them. So I think it's just going to be a huge benefit to the squad. Exactly, exactly. And it might be interesting to kind of see how this works for – some of the more one-dimensional folks, like you look at someone like Emerson, who's not great defensively, but can be progressive and can get the ball forward when he gets on the ball, you know? It, it'll be interesting to see how he kind of fits into this. And if he maybe has more to offer going forward than some of the other guys, and that could be on a game-by-game game basis where Heinze decides, you know what, today I'm taking Franco out, and I'm putting Emerson in there to just be a little more forward-thinking maybe. I don't know. We'll yeah. see. I, I think there's a lot of versatility in these guys, and I think that's exciting when you look at – uh, a three of like Moreno, Ibarra, and so so those are three guys who can do just about everything. That is an energetic, tenacious mm-hmm. midfield right there. And um, and by the way, we should probably expect now for Franco Ibarra to be missing some matches due to suspension from both the <laughs> red cards <laughs> and, and accumulated yellows because he's just that kind of player. So dude's name um, Franco. There'll be at least some getting red time cards. For, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. What an iconic carrying duo. on the tradition. Uh huh. <laughs> Unlike any other. Incredible. I love it. I love it. I think Teodal even brought up some Carlos Carmona references, I think, in that article as well. And anytime we hear that, that kind of gets us going here at Five Star yeah. Final because we love Carmona and Carmona's ability to just literally step on a dude in the first game ever in Atlanta United history and get a red card that was completely detrimental to the team in many ways. Awesome. Love it. Here for it. Here for it. What you should be here for as well is the fact that Atlanta United continues to look like they're going to be able to bring in more folks uh, and folks who are going to contribute immediately. I'm really, really excited about Latoro Giannetti. I tried there, Latoro Giannetti. I had, I had multiple people reach out to me from Rinkin, Georgia last time I mentioned oh, that yeah. I had spent some time there. And they're like, yeah, man, I, under, I understand talking like that. It's just hard to, to, to say words sometimes. <laughs> Latoro Giannetti, um, he's coming from Bella Sarsfield, of course, <laughs> with uh, a lot of Heinze experience already. He was the captain yeah. for Bella Sarsfield. Uh, he's a 27-year-old center back. Folks, this is this feels like this feels like the big one, honestly. This is this is huge. I had never heard of him. And then I went and looked up just looking up his YouTube uh, highlights, as we all do. Um Looked pretty good. Looks pretty mm-hmm. good. Uh, I, I was impressed. I, I was impressed that I kind of honestly that he was that good and I hadn't really heard of him. Uh, he was linked to Sporting Kansas City uh, actually last offseason. They were trying to make a deal for him and I think he ended up signing a short contract extension. So his his contract currently with Velez is reportedly uh, set through 2022. So that means that this would be a typical time where, you know, you kind of find a move for a guy who only has two years left on his contract and you know, we're hearing more now from Felipe Cardenas also, who's kind of reporting some um, behind the scenes details of this transfer, uh, which seemed to be all, like all set to go last week. And now it seems to be hitting a little bit more of a snag. So it's kind of dragging out. But in the end, it, to me, it feels like one that will inevitably get done. Um, it's just a matter of trying to work out some of these some of these issues. And I think that that's the case, honestly, with a lot of MLS teams, because MLS teams have to be very particular with the way that these deals are structured in order to get them to fit into the salary budget and you know all the rules and regulations involved with MLS so um, I I wouldn't be too worried about it but at the time you know as we're recording this right now no no deal is set even though some uh, have reported the last 670 that uh that the the deal was done (laughs) um if we can't trust Vela's 670 who can we trust (laughs) Patrick yeah, did we talk? I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but I, I think there were reports today that he was sitting out of training. Yeah, so, yeah. But, apparently hey, today was his first I, day. I want training. to go. Let's mm-hmm. go. Let's That's get usually a sign. Out. I want Velas to keep their word, I think was the quote, which was fascinating. Yeah. I think that was from uh, Cesar Merlo, of course, who's always very, very on top of these things. But again, a 27 year old center back, it's not quite the profile that we're normally used to, but it's it seems like such a key piece for what Einze wants to do. Again, the captain under him at Bella Sarsfield, at least in some capacity, that's that's a huge thing. And I remember the, a couple of times that you and Teodal were looking at some tactical stuff with Einze and talking about what the center backs did. And this is a guy that's going to know exactly what to do in the system, can can bring folks like Miles along in the system, can explain to them what to do. 
and really kind of lead the team. And that's fascinating to me. I, I think that's huge. Looks very confident on the ball. Like when, like when he's right. on the ball, it's like chest up, head up. He's he's he just looks confident and ready to to kind of dictate the play. And to be honest, it was kind of funny. You know, one of my first instincts when I heard about this news was like, oh, 27. That's not like exactly the profile that I expected Atlanta to go for, you know, because you kind of picture them going younger with more sell-on value and that kind of thing. And then I realized like Leandro Gonzalez Perez is 28. Yep. <laughs> so and it's not, you know, um, He's so yeah. Yeah, twenty seven is is a good. I think it's a good age. You could still potentially sell him on for at least get your money back if he has a couple of good years. I, I don't think it's necessarily wasteful spending at this age by any means. Um, but it, also, he's coming off. I think he had an, he, a torn ACL a couple of years ago. Um, and good to kind of have a player who's not immediately coming off of that. You know, he's had some time to kind of get himself back in form and apparently he's been very very good for Velez uh very key player for them in their kind of resurgence up the league table these last couple of years so I think he's a really really solid player and if Atlanta United can lock this down I think it's a huge signing which kind of brings me to this next point that and we need to acknowledge it as much as we can and for as much as we kind of instigated maybe some negative thoughts last year Ever since MLS is back, this team has done just about everything right. Yeah, and I think we need to mention that. You know, as much as we talked about the front office's mistakes in 2020, everything since then feels like a move in the right direction. And I don't know what kind of reckoning happened there, or what really, if it needed to happen, but it happened in some way. You know, and, and we're moving towards a team that. Maybe we'll, we'll require some patience, understandably, kind of going forward, but as a team that is really starting to stack up very well against some of the top teams in the league when it comes to talent, I worry a bit about depth as far as that goes, but as far as that that first kind of group, it, it's getting there. It's getting there slowly but surely. And if this is a if this is a year zero for Einze, if this is a reset year, it could be a surprisingly special one, if that makes sense, you know? Um, I think next year is always kind of going to be the, the the target year for for go home or go big or go home kind of thing, but this year feel I'm starting to feel optimistic in a way that I wasn't a couple weeks ago. Mm, interesting, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean I, I'll never forget that one of the shows we did. I think it was after the Cincinnati loss. Um, we kind of had two shows after the Cincinnati loss and then after the, uh, after the, uh, what was it? The Columbus crew loss that were uh-huh. very similar, but we talked about the fact that like this team needed to make some tough decisions if it wanted to, um, get back to what it was or what they, you know, thought of themselves to always be. And I think that they, you know, we gave them a ton of credit for, you know, they had to do the right thing and, and get rid of you know Frank DeBoer after that tournament it was just not working out and I think that we're now seeing the benefits of um, having made some of those tough decisions not just him also you know certain players on the roster that kind of thing um, they've done a great job of kind of turning over this roster and it, there's just a totally different vibe heading into the season exactly and it, it comes at the perfect time too when you're just about to start getting fans back in and everything like that I'm, mm-hmm. I'm hoping the vibe in the city kind of picks up where it left off a few years ago and we kind of experienced that same verb and energy around the team. And I think it's worthy of it at this point. I think what they've put in it has made it worthy of that again. So I'm excited to see what happens going forward. And again, full credit to the front office who Joe Patrick are, are coming up with, it seems some creative ways to get players into the team, which leads us to our next signing, <laughs> Ronald Hernandez on loan, on loan now from Aberdeen. Joe, we didn't know about Ronald. The first bullet point under this headline in our show sheet, show sheet just says sketch. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what happened here. I mean, I could make some guesses, but uh, Aberdeen mm-hmm. signed him for 800K from, where was it? Stabek? Somewhere in Norway? Yes, mm-hmm. that's right. Um, and then have and a year later he's on after three appearances I think it was he's on loan mm-hmm. to Atlanta United. Um, Chris Smith, mm-hmm. I would recommend everybody check out Chris Smith. Kind of did like a player profile of uh, Ronald um, that we published on Monday. Some really good quotes. I want to read this one out from uh, Dr. Luis Aguilar, who is the a board member from Hernandez's youth team in Venezuela. This is the quote. It's good to highlight that on his debut with Aberdeen, Hernandez was named man of the match. 
inserting me. I did not know that. That is a really interesting tidbit. When I first read it, I was like, huh, that is funny. Back to Dr. Luis. But from there, Derek, uh, manager Derek McGinnis dropped him, instead using a formation with three central defenders where there was no space for the Venezuelan. In addition, in training, he was performing outstandingly. Only the assistant coach approved him, never McGinnis. It was neither the English language, which he masters at a good level, nor the low temperatures, as he had just come from playing in Norway, nor the absence of his family, who he was never able to bring to Scotland or Europe. It was the technical and tactical decisions made by McGinnis that led to his departure to MLS to a club that had already shown interest in his services since the 2017 FIFA U-20 World Cup, where Venezuela finished the runner-up in that World Cup. I remember watching it. it was, they were really good. Um, so... <laughs> We connecting any dots here with that last part? <laughs> well, I think it's important to keep in mind of that quote too that that is someone who is close to the subject. Mm. Um, so there always, there's always going to be some bias as far as like how much playing time he should have got yeah. and how well cetera, he was doing in training, and how yeah, well yeah. he was doing, and things like that. That being said, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Me and Joe have been talking about how to uh, sneak around this a little bit. Maybe not sneak around, but just kind of address this as best we can. The circumstances are interesting. Yeah, I mean, the public, the information is out there that it's, and it's just bizarre, you know? Exactly, exactly. And we don't, we want to say immediately, like everything is above board, right? Like no yeah, one there's is- there's no rules being broken. There's no rules yeah. being broken at all. But like, let's say, I don't know, let's say- <sighs> Some money found its way to Aberdeen, possibly, maybe, sort of. And, and then a player found its way to Atlanta, and it just kind of, you know, worked out the way it did. It's, it's fascinating how those things work out when it seems like everything is building towards those things working out. And I think that's all we'll, we'll really say about it. But yeah, it's, I mean, well, it's clever is what it I is. Would, I would, it's very clever. It's very clever. And I mean, it's like, you know, with like any regulation, you're always going to have, you know, when you have some sort of these convoluted uh, regulation around salary budgets and all that stuff, you know, the, we're, this is a competition. Like, like these, these clubs, these teams are competing to win trophies and build fan bases and you know be a thriving business and if you want to do that mm -hmm. you got to try to you you know you you got to essentially get around regulations as much as you can like that's why teams have general managers that manipulate salary caps to you know pay transfers on certain times to squeeze guys in you know it's not anything we haven't seen before but this one just seemed to be a little bit even just almost more brilliant I would say, in terms of how, <laughs> how, how this came about. Um, and, and we kind of assume that he's going to be more of the player that we saw um, that he showed himself to be in Norway. Cause we didn't really see him that much. And it was kind mm -hmm. of interesting having talked to some of the Aberdeen, not, well, not talk to them, but just kind of witnessing what they've been saying on Twitter and things like that. It's not necessarily that he was bad. They're just baffled at like why he only appeared three times and that he was a waste mm -hmm. of money because he didn't really make it. He didn't, play you know so it but it wasn't necessarily from what i've read about the performance of the player so i think that there that's kind of i think that that's gotten kind of muddied up we haven't we haven't we haven't made a college football reference here in a while but but keep in mind that like i don't know like you can drive around the university of georgia campus and you can see a young football player in like a brand new dodge charger and you can be like hmm they're in college <laughs> they don't have jobs how they get those you know and no one will really say anything right but maybe if you're like an old miss and you like or a Tennessee and you hand out McDonald's bags full of cash to players in the dumbest possible way, everyone's going to be a little upset. You can you can always cheat, Joe Patrick. This is the SEC doctrine here. You can yeah. always cheat. You've just got to be good at cheating. Yeah, you, you, you when you're out of scholarships, you send them to the military JUCO. Um, exactly. Year, you send them down to Milledgeville, the GMC. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then they, and they come back up. Um, yeah. So there you go. There you go. But no, I'm, I'm excited about this player. I think it'll be interesting to kind of see where he fits in. Uh, I think that I think that right back position is interesting. I don't I think, know. I mean, he, he's more of a traditional right back, right? As yeah. opposed to like Franco Escobar, more of the tweener type. It seems like Ronald Hernandez is much more of just like a solid right back, traditionally kind of getting up and down. Which we can assume probably puts him above Brooks Lennon, depending on the formation at this point, right? Like it's a back so. four, it's going to be him instead of Lennon. And if they decide to go to a back three with a wing back kind of thing, it'll probably be Lennon. So we'll, we'll figure that out, I guess, when we come to it and kind of see and, how Einze views Lennon. 
nice little tidbit in there as well from that quote that I read earlier that he speaks English, good English apparently, yeah. which is mm -hmm. always helpful. That is, that is, that is. Uh, always helpful to get a player out on loan who you're not really planning on using as well. We haven't talked about it yet, Joe Patrick, but Brandon Meza leaves for a defensa e Justicia on loan. Uh, he's rumored to go back to San Lorenzo, which is his former club, which we talked a little bit about last week, but ends up uh, defense e Justicia instead. And it kind of clears the way it looks like for, I think the plan is for Latora Gianetti. I remember we talked about what the canary in the coal mine for the center back coming in would be, and it would be whether or not Freedom Meza was sent out or not. So as soon as Meza kind of got sent out, we all kind of looked at each other and went, okay, here comes the next big thing. And then there it was, and there it should be soon. So hang with me here. Fernando Meza is joining Defensa e Justicia to be the replacement for David Martinez. <laughs> who, who uh -huh. David Martinez was the Fernando Meza replacement in Atlanta. Right. For like <laughs> so two it's days. Like, it's like come for a full circle. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, kind of funny how that, how that worked out. Um, turns out everybody who was tracking his Instagram was right. That, <laughs> that he's, uh, <laughs> he's still in Argentina. Argentina. Uh -huh. Yeah. Everybody was uh, talking about that. So I'm kind of surprised that Atlanta let him go, um, you know, before they've actually brought in a center back, but apparently it was the Argentine transfer window uh, deadline day was the, the night that he was announced was the deadline night. So um, they had to let him go essentially if they wanted to clear him mm -hmm. off their books. So uh, I think Atlanta United right now is probably a little more kind of exposed to an extent in that position, you know, just without the, the player that they need right now. Um, which may give Velez a little bit of leverage uh, in these negotiations for Gianetti. But, you know, I still expect that to get done. And um, best of luck to Fernando. I feel bad for him because he just, what a terrible year to try to come to Atlanta. Yeah. Um, and just nothing really worked out for him. He had injuries, with, didn't his family, he was away from his wife for like almost a, almost a year. Or so just a really difficult period for him. And, thinking about all that it shouldn't be that surprising that the form wasn't quite there and just hope that for him that he can get back to his best um in argentina we wish him the best and we'll just have to see what happens like i said lot, lots of unknowns here but lots of unknowns to be excited about and folks you should also be excited about this quick break Joe, we have listeners. Joe, those listeners had questions. We had a, a whole god dang bunch today. So many. Uh, it keeps love getting it. bigger and bigger, and we love to see that. We love to see that. We love to see our listener numbers go up. This is this is the rising tide of Fire Strike Final is is creeping, but but rising all the same, all the same. Um, Y'all are great. We we had a bunch of interesting questions. I think in this one, we're gonna try to get to as many of them as we can before we get to rapid fire and pop off real quick on all of those. Um, our first one comes from Steven, who asks, outside of Barco slash Bello, who do y'all think has the highest sell-on potential slash expectation from the fan base at this point? I, I thought about this, and I, I think pretty quickly the, the sell-on potential is a pretty clear answer. It, it, it's miles, right? That's yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. And with it, with a center back, they're not the most expensive players, you know, like naturally mm -hmm. attacking players who score goals are going to be more expensive, but I still think, yeah, I, miles is um, I, I would just would not be shocked if he's honestly not for Atlanta much longer. I mean, if he wants to make a move, you know, I, I don't even know his age off the top of my head. Um, but he obviously was in college for a point. And then, you know, if he wants to really make a move in Europe, uh, and he's a very cultured guy. Like, he, you know, he, he's got like his, uh, he's just, I, I could totally see him in Europe. He's 23 years old, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think he'll be gone. I would not be surprised to see these Bundesliga teams come in for him. Obviously, that seems to be like a, a big destination point um, for these American players. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I think Mark McKenzie went to Genk for like 6 million, I think is what it was. So it, it might be somewhere around there. I kind of see them. In that same kind of vein, if you if you're looking for a, an American center back, it'll be interesting to see who ends up being the bigger transfer. Honestly, yeah. One of the things with him is I'll be interested to see what teams end up becoming linked to him. Like what what exactly, teams are interested yeah. in him? Because I think that that will be uh, that will be kind of telling as to like how his progression is going. Because before when he was 
you know, he always has been a great defender. His defensive instincts are amazing. And I've always thought that he would be a good uh, player for like a team that's not going to have much of the ball where he's not relied to pass the ball around a bunch. Mm -hmm. Um, But if he can progress that part of his game, I think we'll start to see even, you know, bigger, better teams come in for him. Yeah. He's going to be thrown into the pool on that. It's going to be sink Mm -hmm. or swim as far as circulating the ball and everything like that and increasing those skills. And like I said, hopefully, Giannetti can kind of help him out with that. And I think the system will help him out. That'll force him to, to get better at that. And when teams see that he's a little more well-rounded, they're going to come circling, I think. I think he lasts the year. I don't think he's gone in the summer. But I think if he yeah. puts them together a solid year, then then he's the next one to go as far as as far as selling on and everything like that. But I'm not sure. Maybe maybe you mentioned the center backs don't go as much, and you're right. So maybe highest salon potential is someone like Nabara or a Sosa. It's probably Sosa, I guess, if, if Everton yeah, is coming to call on everything like that. Mm-hmm. If we're really keeping in spirit with the, with the question. But we're so familiar with Miles at this point. I think the expectation level is higher for him. And I wonder what, we know there are big just, things to come. On, on Just on this point, I, I'm what, what would you think Joseph Martinez is if, if he were to be sold? I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what he would go mm, for, him, honestly. Mm, coming off an ACL tear is interesting. Uh, yeah, I guess he is coming off an ACL. That's true. That would probably scare some teams. He's 27. Oh, he's 27. Mm. That's not, wow, he's 27. Isn't that crazy? He's been here a long time, y'all. He really has. Uh, <laughs> wow, that's weird, actually. I didn't think about that. Yeah, no, he's been here four or five years. So that, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, so no, I'd probably be somewhere around 10 million, honestly. Yeah, and I don't think probably. it's ever going to happen. I wonder, like, Unless he, 10 like, million is kind of the ballpark. Punts a ball into a child it. in anger. <laughs> you know, we have to get rid of him for some reason. It's interesting because 10 million is about extent. the price that I'm thinking about for Miles, potentially. Like, if, yeah. if he has a great season, I think he could get his value up about that high. We'll see. We'll see yeah joseph's not going anywhere don't worry guys yeah. andrew had a question who says do we have any inkling how Einze will actually try to play the squad other than attractive soccer and the answer is yes yes we do we've uh we've talked a bit about it in episodes past we'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about it now uh it's either a 4-3-3 or very bielsa 3-3-1-3 kind of thing which is a, basically just a modified 3-4-3 all those kind of things we're really worried about formation uh but it, it's a pretty high press it's a narrow high press so if you kind of break it out on the wings you can kind of get in trouble a little bit if you're the opposing team um so I don't know. There's, there's lots of triggers there. It's not a super, super high press. Don't get super excited. We're not Red Bulls. It's going to be that. It's going to be possession-based. It's going to be a little more direct than Frank. Yeah. Did that, did that about cover it? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really it's really tough to describe these things verbally in a podcast right. form, like tactics and things like that, because it's such a visual thing, concept. But um, the one thing that stood out to me just when watching a lot of uh, Heinze's teams, the, those Velez teams, is a lot of play down the wings. Like that, like it seems like that's where the buildup happens is um, mm-hmm. overloading those wings with the wing back, the, the wingers and the center backs on the side, as well as central midfielders coming over to the side and just creating lots of those little triangles to kind of move the way your way up the field and then that's kind of how the attack is launched so um that's kind of what i'm expecting but again it's we don't really have any concrete ideas because maybe he changes the way his approach based on the players that he has at his disposal so we'll see yeah. which is good which is the only thing encouraging that's about that is that it, it's clear he's studied mls so if he does have different ideas on how to play it'll be well researched it won't mm-hmm. just be like he woke in a fever dream one night and it's like we're actually gonna play five at the back it's gonna be well thought out you know, so I think you don't have too much to worry about there. Just let it, just let it wash over you, Andrew. Just let it wash over you. One thing I could just easily clarify for people, because we've talked about the the three three one three before, and you just called it like a modified four three four three. Think about it like this: it's like a three, it's like a three four three, except the four is like a diamond midfield. Yeah. Think about it like that. That's it. That's the whole thing. Even Bielsa has kind of gotten away from that. You know, he, yeah, he's yeah. Four, one, four, one. it's more like a three, three, one, three is more like conceptual in terms of like that. That's where players take up positions on the field. It's not like they're starting formation. Like when we, when I talk about formations, typically it's, it's more of like, that's where they would be like off the ball, especially like defensively, they would be in this kind of shape. Um, and then 
you when you have the ball, then you can morph into these other shapes. And I think that that's kind of where a lot of the three three one three stuff comes in. But anyway, we're kind of in the weeds now. We'll we'll see what happens. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Which which leads us to the next question, which is spot on. It's a good question from Carlos, who asked, "How many center backs are needed for the season?" And I think if Giannetti comes in, I think we're set in my in my head anyway. With Anton, with Campbell, Miles, and Giannetti, that seems like enough. It seems like it, like especially because there just aren't rumors. Like there aren't rumors out there for mm-hmm. other center backs, other players, really. Um, you know, these things can crop up at any time. But yeah, I think it. If there isn't another center back coming in, I think it's probably positive in that it could mean that the team is likes what they see from some of these players that are a little bit more untested. Um, and I think also in MLS, you have to, to an extent, you have to start to rely on some of these um, untested players and you, you get, you got to, you know, put them through the fire and, and see if they can succeed. You can't just like keep a, a homegrown sitting on the bench forever. And we saw that with a guy like Miles Robinson, who we've talked about. Um, he was quite untested under Tata Martino. He only had a handful of appearances, like one start or two starts, something like that. Um and then Frank DeBoer gave him his shot and he performed well, you know, so maybe that will happen with some other guys, but they won't be needed. I don't think to be like a starting players, the starting 11 are set. So, um, well, it'll be interesting to see how guys like George Campbell and these types of guys uh, step up to the occasion. Yeah. We still don't have any words too on Jack Bauer, Jack Bauer, John Bauer, Jack, what's the 24 Jack, character and what's the yeah, soccer Jack, player? Jack Bauer, Jack Bauer. Jack Bauer. Yeah. Yeah. And that's who, we're, how we're going to call him. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's, That's the draft pick. We still don't have any word on him. He may be part of this team. He may not. Who knows? But Josh Bauer, thank you. He could he could be though. He could be though. And we may actually have to learn his name. But that that's another option. Um, I think you should consider too. I think we found out today that Miles is on the preliminary roster for the Olympics coming up. Am I right in saying that? Yes. I yes. think I am. So that could potentially be. The Olympics, man. A part of time where we miss Miles. So there may be some options coming up for, for folks to kind of get in in place of him. But right now, I think we're we're a set. As Joe shakes his head at the idea Never of the Olympics. one of the world's great sporting events. I'm just kidding. I actually love in the unity. Olympics, but, but do we need soccer in the Olympics? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know. I don't quite get it. I don't quite get it. I think it's... it's not I mean, if it affects me. If it affects me, exactly. I don't want it. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And it's going to affect a lot of MLS. That's going to be extremely interesting yeah, if, well, if the Olympics even happen. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a cluttered year no matter what. You got Gold Cup, you got some Nations League nonsense. You got so all sorts of contests going on throughout the entire season, which is going to, going to make things fascinating for sure. For sure. The other fascinating thing, though, is... Rapid Fire. Joe, we're going right now to Rapid Fire. Santiago asks, when are the Mouths of the South podcast crew going to drop a pod again? We miss Josh and Sam making fun of Eric. I miss them too, but I, I was actually just in contact with Josh about this because I was curious. I was curious <laughs> the other, too. Yeah. The other day. <laughs> uh, but they should be back. I think they'll be back. Um, yeah, they just got a lot of stuff going on right now. I think Eric got a new job, Eric Quintana. Um, so he's been busy with that, but I think once they, they're more like reacting to the games, I feel like, and stuff like that. So I think once the games come back, once the training starts up again, I think you'll be hearing a lot from them as well. So it's good. That's good. We, we need that. We need them to break up our feet a little bit. It's a little too much five strike final right yeah. now. We can't keep disappointing people like this. <laughs> Bill asks, where am I supposed to use my season ticket holder coins from last season? Now that Chuck E. Cheese filed for bankruptcy last summer, Bill, go to Dave and Buster's like an adult. God damn yeah. it. JR asks, who wore it better, Darren or Mr. Peanut? I think he's that, referring to the top bat and monocle thing. Yeah, the, it, this is in reference, obviously, to the Franco Ibarra signing, uh, which was incredible. He, I feel like he keeps topping himself. Uh, and I kind of fear for like where this is going because it's just like step up, step up. And then <laughs> it's like at some point he's going to be doing some like cliff diving exactly it's going to be like a skydiving into like the front (laughs) seat of a monster truck and it's going to be like well look it's this random player from banfield we did it guys and it's it's it's, it could possibly potentially become hazardous to us all we don't want that to happen stay safe darren chris asks following up on your kit discussion from last week why are there no premium authentic kits for women it probably has to do with some sales number they have 
that says it's not cost beneficial to make it whatever, blah, 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 blah. It's something like that. We don't actually know the answer. It would be kind of nice if they had the option. I don't get why they just don't have the option. Maybe the authentic thing is like that it's built for male soccer players and that's quotation marks authentic. I don't know. I don't know. So the authentic kits are actually cut differently than the replicas. Like it's not just the embroidery and stuff like that. It's like they are actually like a slimmer fit because those are like the kits that a player would wear. Um, and so I think that that's one reason, but also I just don't like, I feel like for a women's kit, you should be able to at least like get the, you know, the Atlanta United embroidery on the side, like the authentic yeah. ones have, and just like, you should, I feel like you should be able to. It feels like that'd be stuff, so easy that to do. Available. As yeah, well. like, I, don't know. I know. I don't um, when I've bought like Premier League kits, it's like you, you literally have like options for like which patches and stuff you want to add. <laughs> yeah. it's just like a, just like a a la carte price uh, for all those things. Seems mm -hmm. like MLS should have something like that. Um, or I guess it's uh, Adidas that is the the yeah. the partner here, but yeah, um, it's this stuff is always complicated. Stargate, yeah, exactly. Stargate, Stargate, Xanadu. Anyway, uh, Ed asks, who is actually the boss, Tony or Angela? It's been proven. It's been proven with detailed research that Angela Bauer was in fact the boss. The real question is, what was happening on what's happening? Chris Herbert asks, any winger transfer rumors out there like Jurgen Dam, but would rather have him as a second half sub? But Chris, I agree. I agree. Uh, but we haven't heard anything. Really haven't. Well, yeah, Jurgen Dam will be a great second half sub when he's coming in for uh, the starter, Eric Lopez. There we go. Joe's going to keep pushing that train <laughs> all the way to the front of the station. Uh, he By also the way, asked. I'm, I got to say, I'm really glad you could answer Ed's question about the boss because I had no idea what that was. I did Google it and I saw Tony Danza and now I'm feeling like I got to go back and watch some watch some old episodes. You don't. I'll tell you where it's from later. Anyway, uh, Chris also asked, when's the D&D &D episode? I have had thoughts about doing like a, a soccer based D&D &D choose your own adventure type show before. Uh, but until someone actually makes that, we're not doing it. Not doing it. Not I'd yet. I had a brother. My, I had a brother. Still have him. Uh, but Congrats. when he was a kid, he uh, I don't know if he played Dungeons and Dragons or how often he would do it, but he would definitely paint the little things. There was like little uh, little um, rapid fire figu figurines. Rapid fire. Okay, sorry. Sorry. That's enough. <laughs> and that By the way, was he's way more successful. Than almost him, rapid so. fire. God damn it. That was rapid fire. We really got to figure out that whole process. We're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> we promise. Uh, Joe, any final thoughts for the people before we get out of here? Not really. Just um, just getting more and more excited. Every every one of these shows we do, I feel like the excitement is building. And I am just I just can't wait to kind of see what this team ends up looking like under Gabriel Heinze, like we've been talking about this whole show. So it, just excited. Everyone should be optimistic right now. The weather's getting nicer. The vaccines are increasing. Soccer is coming back. Every, everyone should be feeling pretty darn good, I think, in my opinion. In my opinion. It, at least better than they have been. It's coming good. It's Everybody's coming good. making money on trading sports cards. No one's um, doing you know, that, I don't think. What is, have you seen this NBA Top Shot thing where like you yes. can buy like the videos or whatever? I don't get it. I was honestly terrified looking into this. I was actually, <laughs> I was looking into this while I was at an NBA game. I was covering it for 99 the other night and I was like looking at top, the Top Shots things. And I realized mm -hmm. that we're like a couple years away from living in the Tron universe where it's just like we're all <laughs> digital. What a shitty time for Daft Punk to break up then. Oh, I know. <laughs> Or timing. Maybe one of them will like sign a deal to do some like uh, background music for the top shot. <laughs> it's like amazing. It, it's amazing. Yeah, it's so weird. We could go way deep. We could go for hours. I'd, I'd rather not. I'd rather not. But I will say that Daft Punk is playing at my house later. At my house. Uh, Joe, I think that's it. I think that's all we got. We will be back at some point soon with a new episode. We've got some exciting interviews coming up. Like I said, we've got some exciting things in the works uh, that will have in your feed very, 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 very shortly. Anything else? That's it. Bye, y'all.